From the Earth to Mars to Titan, who better to take you there than thinking through autonomy? I promised you a glimpse of space exploration last season, and we're embarking on that adventure today with Dr. Jeff Delane, a member of the Mars Ingenuity Navigation Team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. The Ingenuity helicopter team just accomplished one of the greatest engineering feats in aviation history by taking off, flying around, and safely landing on Mars. In fact, four times now, as of our recording date. Ingenuity's navigation team plays a critical role in keeping the helicopter safe and on course. Jeff will take us through how Ingenuity flies across Mars without getting lost, and how this team developed cutting-edge autonomous navigation to use on another planet. I'm thrilled to be talking to a member of a team of incredible explorers and engineers. And, yes, we'll be talking about why Saturn's moon Titan is the next great adventure in aviation. This episode was recorded on Sol 70. Please like us and subscribe. Thank you so much for joining me on Thinking Through Autonomy. And I cannot tell you how excited I am to be talking to you as you and the team continue to fly Ingenuity on Mars. You're between flights four and five now. The mission's been extended for 30 days and transitioned to operations demonstration phase. And I think that's NASA talk for Ingenuity is going to be a scout for perseverance. And I am just wondering, has it hit you and this remarkable team that you have probably accomplished one of the greatest engineering feats in the history of aviation? I, I don't think it has sunk in yet. Uh, like, no, one of the reasons for that is that, no, uh, the operation team is still, like, no, focusing on the flight, like, no. Uh, so I think, like, no, that may sink in, like, no, once this is all done. Uh, but, like, no, right now, the operation part of the team, like, no, which are, like, the people that you see in these videos, like, no, is very much focused on the flight and, like, no, and, and trying to extend it and make sure we get good flights for as long as we can. So I'm sure there'll be a day, whether it's six months or a year from now, you'll sit back and say, wow, what have we done? Maybe have a big JPL party? Yeah, we've, we've been talking about this party for a while. Like, you know, they've been like, you know, the, the so-called WebEx party, like, you know, where we go, all go on a video link so far. Like, you know, they're, they're pretty fun, but like, you know, nothing like a, a, a good celebration together that we, you know, we hope we can have soon. <laughs> That's great. And, and let me just ask you this. Put yourself back where you were as you're wa watching the rocket take off and head towards Mars, what did you and the team calculate as your chances of success? Was Ingenuity gonna fly or, or, or what? I would say like, no, so first I'm gonna start saying that no, probably different people in the team have like no different answers to that because like no, like a lot of us like no, have like dealt with like different subsystem. I was more on the navigation side, like no, some people were more like at the system level, some others were on the thermal side, like no, so we, we each know, like, you know, what are the key assumptions we did. Uh, like, you know, I would say from our side, like, you know, we were, like, you know, definitely confident that we had put in the work and, like, you know, and try to brainstorm and think of, like, you know, all the possible things that could happen. You know, and at some point, you know, you just, you just got to go with it. You've been given a chance, like, you know, you got to go. You know, there's, there was definitely a non-negligible chance that, you know, some things we hadn't thought of, like, you know, could slip in. Uh, you know, for instance, specifically on the navigation side, like, you know, we had an assumption whether, like, you know, there was going to be a dust cloud when we take off that would affect the navigation camera that we use, like, to 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 guide the autopilot. Like, you no, know, so had we been right, like, you no, know, we made the assumption that, you no, know, up until a meter off the ground, we should not use that camera, but then it would be okay. Like, you no, know, was that right? Was that you no know, too, 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 too stressing? Like, we didn't know for sure. Um, so, look, I would say, like, you know, probably at 95% chance, but, like, you know, it's, it's still 5% chance, yeah. like, like, enough to make you stress on the, the day of the first flight, for sure. And then you have the first flight, which I want to talk about in a little bit, and the second and the third, and you just finished a successful fourth flight. D does the stress level increase, or are you confident after the first four flights that you've mitigated as many risks as you possibly could getting ready for flight testing in your first flights on Mars? Um, 
so I think you know, the, the stress level of the team has like you know is definitely like you know a bit reduced in a sense because like you no know, we've like you no know, we were going to Mars for like a technology demonstrations and like you know the milestones there like you know have been reached and uh, I think for a lot of people like you know they were like you know that uh, that day of the first flight like you know that was like you know a, like a, a, a milestone for like you know the rest of your careers like you know if it fails like you know well maybe you're gonna have to wait another five or ten years to retry that technology demonstration and like you know it may never happen again like you know it, people may have said well that's given on the reason of the failure that may have been too tricky like you no know, maybe that was impossible but if that was successful well no maybe a lot of the technology and projects that are currently at research level like you no know, would move at a faster pace like there you know, was a, a mission proposal like you no know, and potentially flight in a few in a few years like you know so like we, we're very glad that we made it through that phase now like you no know, we and I think we're in the phase now where like everything is like bonus like you know that that new uh, that new mission for operation demonstration all the data we're getting like you know it's, it's just like you no know, precious engineering data like you new know, to demonstrate new capabilities develop new models and like you know and and get get a better future helicopter or, like you know if we if we get that chance so when you look up in the sky tonight and you see mars what are you thinking uh i, I tell you what actually like um a few months back, there was the uh, you know, the opposition of Mars, like you no, know, which I think it was over the summer. Uh, it was like you no, know, the, the closest point Mars was was going to be like you no know, from Earth, like for the next uh, twenty years or so. Uh, and so me and another JPL friend, like you know, we took our friends and we went. Uh, he just got like this telescope, you know, and we went to see to see Mars because he has this huge scope. Like you know, you could actually make out some of the features on the surface, and because the conditions were so good, like you no, know, we tried to like you know understand what areas of Mars we're looking at and we could actually see okay, oh this is like you know the area where like uh, spirit and opportunity landed and um and at some point we saw like you know I mean the area that that, that looked like we're going to be like where, where Jezero crater was going to be and um like I remember that night specifically thinking yeah I mean I mean ingenuity and perseverance that I know at somewhere to the right of that point like you know and soon we are going to be getting there um so that that, that, that was pretty cool um I think the the feeling that we are on that our baby is on Mars really sunk in when we saw the EDL video uh, on February 18. You see that you know that like this is happening now. Some people are actually amazing. The thing. Um, yeah, that was the point I say. So deep down, are you feeling more of explorer or engineer, or is there this combination that we can't understand because we haven't been there? What do you feel like? Uh, I would say definitely engineer, like you no, know, I mean f for now, like you no, know, it's uh, like you know for I guess a lot of people in the team, like you know that that that's the kind of project you know you you get into these careers for, but like you know when you when you're finally called like you no know, to, to 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 try to make it happen, like you no, know, you want to make sure do you give it your best shot, like you no, know, so you're like you're trying to like use all these years of experience and know and skills and course and like you know everything you've learned in your past to make it happen. And you know, and like you no, know, we were in that phase during the design. I like you know, now that there's the data coming in, like you no, know, so the operation team is very much in that phase to like make sure to understand the data, like you no, know, make sure they fit the model. What are we learning? And we will be in that phase for like you no, know, for the next few years at least, as we like you no, know, use this data, like you no, know, to improve the future projects. Um, so it's 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 an engineering phase, but like you know, sometimes you take a step back, like you know, and you look, and yeah, it's 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 pretty cool to see uh, like what, what these uh, objects are, are are doing up there. Jeff, you are a member of a larger engineering team and a larger navigation team. Can you tell us a little bit about your colleagues? Yeah, definitely. So the, the navigation team was part of the, the, the GNC guidance navigation team like that was led by Harvard Grip. The specific navigation group you know, was led by uh, David Bayard, who's a JPL fellow. I like know his design navigation system for years at JPL and when he was you know, really the brain to like you know, to put all the paths together. On the on the vision side specifically, like you no, know, we had like the image processing front from the camera. Uh, like you no, know, was designed uh, by Larry Mattis, uh, Roland Brokers, and myself. Uh, like you no, know, Roland Brokers and I were involved in the development and, and testing of the navigation software. And then we have like you know, all this uh, the information like you know, that's coming on top of the camera, the laser rangefinder, the initial system, and what we call the state estimation, the navigation algorithm that you know, that puts all this input together and puts the the the, the estimate. Like, you know, was was implemented by Dylan Conway in the team, and so like this this small group of people, like you know, about six of them, like you know, we were like the, um, the the key of that navigation team. I would call it a small group of people that helped change the world. 
You know, there are young professionals, kids, students all across the planet that are looking up this, at the sky and thinking, I want to explore the solar system. How can they be like Jeff? How, how do they get on this amazing ingenuity team? W what's your advice for someone who looks up in the sky and says, I need to go there? Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give like, you know, a single advice. Like, you know, first, because there were like, you know, so many more people than just me in the team. Like, you know, and there are so many ways to get into this kind of mission. Like, you know, I would say, you know, ob obviously, like, a, a, a big part of the team was like, you know, made of like, engineers, like, you know, because it was a, a technology demonstration. So there were more engineers than scientists, but like you no, know, even then, like you know, you well, you, know, you, you were you had some navigation people like me, but you also had like you know, like progressively coming out like guidance, control, like you know, thermal, mechanical, aerodynamics expert, uh, like you know, and then you like you add like the whole like spacecraft component on top of the aircraft uh, part, like you know, like the like the crew, the idiot, like uh, so having the launch. Um, so uh, in the end, like even if it's like a helicopter and you think it could be pretty specific, like all the all the specifics of being like a, a, an aerospace engineer are involved. So I would say like you know if you if you like aerospace in general, probably the best advice is to among all these disciplines find the one that you know that that you like most, and that's probably going to end up like you know the one that you end up being the best at because like you know even if you're not the best at the beginning, like you know that's going to come through work, uh, and just like you know just keep going like you know, everyone in this like you know in this specific team like you know when you talk to them they had some obstacles to surmount like you know and you, if you don't give up like you know at some point something's going to happen I'm I'm convinced of that that that's great I I want to go back about a, a week and a half right now back to April 21st which is the day of ingenuity's first remarkably incredible flight and I've seen pictures of the ingenuity team scanning their computer monitors and they're looking for something on the screen and then they start cheering. And I just want to know, what was that something that you saw that said Ingenuity flew and landed and on Mars? Was there like a Eagle has landed message? Was it a bunch of ones and zeros? But what told you that you accomplished what you had been working on for so many years? So the, the specific data we were looking at was the altimetry data. Like, you know, so there is a laser range finder on board, like, you know, so a, like a, a small laser that tells you how far you are off the ground. Like, you know, so what you want this to tell you is that you no, know, like at first it was close to the ground at like 15 centimeters, and like, you know, it took off and then it, it came down at like, you know, at, at, at the same height. That was like you know, the first simple data like, you know, that tells us, okay, everything happened correctly. Uh, there were some like you no know, positive like message that came before that like you no know, just the fact that first that we're getting data like that you know, means okay like you know somehow we we've survived the landing and the flight that's the good news and then like you know no major error comes come come comes in but you no know, really that plot I think like you know is when the chief pilot of our group like you know like officially said okay we've landed on we've we've flown and we've landed safely on on Mars. So uh, nobody put in an Easter egg that kind of said you owe me fifteen bucks I told you it would fly. <laughs> I know that I'm aware of, but uh... <laughs> yeah, we'd hate we'd hate to have one of the greatest moments in aviation clouded by, hey, you owe me a couple dollars, right? <laughs> <laughs> but when you started looking at that data from the first flight, how close did it match to what you had been practicing here on Earth and the models that you had built? Was it close, sort of close, or wow, we didn't expect that? The first flights were very close, and actually, like you know, I'm I'm going to quote again, like you know, uh, Avad Grip, the chief pilot on this one, he, he actually said that you know that the the first data he got sent, like you know, he thought that was a prank on him, like so somehow like someone in the team had sent him like some simulation data, like you know, and like you know, and like given him like as a prank, like he thought he, he could not believe how good it was, and uh, so that that yeah, that that's just telling like how, how good it is. Now, like you, like you know. What you need to realize is that you no, know, the the first flight was like specifically tailored to match the condition in which we tested in the vacuum chamber. Like you no, know, there's a there's a reason why we stayed only on the vertical flight, like only went up to three meters. Like you no, know, so if something goes wrong, like you know, we are close to the ground, we can try to to land and get to safety. Like we on the first one, we you know we 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 wanted to stay on the same trajectory we could we could test in the vacuum chamber, and these were the up and downs that you saw. So nothing was left to chance on that first flight. You had the data that you had to see come back. That's correct. Well, you're part of Ingenuity's navigation team, and I want to talk to you a little bit about how you navigate this incredible vehicle on Mars. And I want to frame this discussion around maybe Ingenuity's hardware and software 
and how they link together to successfully take you from point A to B. And Jeff, as I understand it, the vehicle weighs about 1.8 kilos or four pounds on Earth. It's about a pound and a half on Mars. The rotor blades are about 1.2 meters. And I'm that seems to be a pretty small package. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the challenges you faced in outfitting Ingenuity with this navigation system in, in really, a, you know, a, a small avionics compartment. Yeah, uh, definitely. So the first challenge is that, you know, we knew, uh, like, you know, that to be able to autonomously fly and control Ingenuity, like we had to use this uh, vision-based navigation system, like, you know, where you use uh, the camera to sort of like play the role of like what GPS would do on Earth, like, you know, like the commercial drones, like, you know, that you can buy off the shelf here, like, you know, and used to like take pictures of you when you're on a hike or something. They can fly on their own, like, you know, you don't need to read an expert pilot to have them, but they're going to do this, like, you know, using GPS signal to, like, you know, determine the position, the velocity, uh, the, the, they get the orientation using other sensors called, like, the inertial sensors, like, you know, to find the orientation of the gravity, and, like, you know, so that all that is used, like, you know, to steer the aircraft when you're on Earth. When you're on Mars, like, you know, you can have inertial sensors like to to get the gravity but like you no know, if you only use that like you know that's uh, after like you know a period of a few seconds your velocity is going to drift and you won't be able like you know to to fly yourself like to a safe landing like you're just going to go way faster or way slower than you think and that's not going to be stable so we we needed that navigation camera and we needed algorithms that now were able like to process these images and in real time, like, you know, feed that velocity, this position estimate that are, that are like, you know, used by the autopilot to just like fly safely. And that the, the, the flight computers that know that and, and, the, and, and, and the CPU frequencies that you need, like, you know, to run that in real time with like 30 images a second, that's like, you know, th these requirements are like way higher than like, you know, what, what the hover computers could do right now. So there was, um, one of the main innovations of Ingenuity in terms of like space flight was to commit to using off the shelf computers, like, you know, similar to what you had in, uh, like, you know, on your smartphone a few years back, like still like not as good as what you what you have in your smartphone today. Uh, like, you no, know, but that's, that's already like, you know, almost 15 years ahead of like what's, what's in the, in, in, in the over computers. Let me ask you this because I noted that you kept using the word camera instead of cameras and having done a little bit of research on your background, You've been doing a lot of writing about range visual inertial odometry, and clearly that uses one camera where, you know, if you look at, for the audience that might be familiar, Tesla has many cameras on there. What, what's the challenge of using a camera versus cameras and maybe other ways of fixing the position of the vehicle in three dimensions? Right. So if you use only one camera, um, you, you can't know the what we call the matrix scale of the scene you know which means like you no know, you're you're gonna see like you no know, rock pebbles maybe rubber tracks in there and like you know and if you look at these images as a human like you know you might know okay like the, the rover track like the rover wheels are this big like you know so you get a sense of like you know how big the objects are like on the scene but that's because your brain like you know has seen ingenuity before like you know it has some references for how big things are like you could produce the same image like you know uh, with a mile wide rover like you know in a giant world like you know and, and the, this image would look the same and what that means is that ingenuity using the camera is only able to estimate the direction of motion so the direction of the velocity vector it is not able to get the magnitude of that vector so how fast it's going so it can tell okay i'm moving upwards in the image but it can't tell from the camera only if it's going upward at like one meter a second two meters per second ten meters a second so that's the limitation of only using one camera. If you were able to use, you know, like say a stereo stereo camera, like those the two of them, just like you no know, like humans have two eyes, and you were close enough, like you know, that you could measure like you know the the, the what we call the disparities, like you no, know, so the image displacement from one camera to the to the other camera, then you you could retrieve this scale information. But because the the fuselage of ingenuity, like you know, and the the space like in which you have we put the to put the camera, which is just like just a few centimeters wide, it's way too small to get that information at five meters. So in the end, one camera is really all we could afford, and we had to use you know, these other sensors, the, the laser rangefinder and the uh, the inertial uh, sensors to retrieve that scale uh, that you need to uh, to pilot the aircraft. As you've had conversations about what future vehicles look like. Do you think that there is going to be a push 
to develop a larger vehicle to use stereo cameras? Or have you accomplished what you need to using a single camera and the laser rangefinder? So that that depends for what the um, the so there are research projects like you know that have started right after uh, the design phase of Ingenuity was finished. That was already like two years ago. So like you know so the operation part of the operation team like you know which are like the ten people you see on the videos like you know it's a very small part of you know the overall engineering team. That's like you no know, like almost two hundred people. A lot of the people like you know have moved on to like you know research projects like now I'm part of that group. And so one concept you know, that we are like there's a few research publications on is called the Mars Science Helicopter concept. You know? So it, it designed like it, that's in partnership with NASA Ames, uh, Aero Environment, like you know, all the same partners that you have for Ingenuity. And we we've currently come up with like versions of the vehicle where you can fly an ex uh, an exa rotor, like you no, know, so it's six rotors, like you no, know, uh, on the side on about 30 kilogram vehicle that can carry up to five kilogram payload. This vehicle, like, no, we are still using the same, like, no, range, visual, and inertial sensors. We've changed the algorithm a bit because we'd like to explore, like, no, more challenging terrains. Like, no, usually, like, scientists want to go in the hardest places for engineers. Like, no, so we, we, are, we are trying to, to meet their demands. We are, like, they may, like, we are still investigating the use for stereo, but this, no, because this, uh, this, uh, the, this new helicopter, like, no, would, like, would be potentially larger, they're also going to fly higher off the ground. Like, no, so the, the same constraints we had on Ingenuity, which is like, you no, know, if you're if you're too close, like, you no, know, like you like you you like oh, sorry, if you're too far, like you can't use like multiple cameras to get that three D information. It's even worse on the on the larger helicopters. Uh, one aspect that may not be true, like, you no, know, if you want to like do like a close up inspection of like no specific you no know, geological crops, say, like you no, know, and get a three D map, like you no, know, of the terrain, like without having to move around, like you no. Know, then like a stereo camera could be could, could be interesting but that's that's still research level for now like you know we are we're still investigating this and you have uh, a couple more planets to explore too so you, you may have the chance to do that uh one one of our mutual colleagues is dr sanjeev singh and one thing he said about autonomy was this autonomy is about flying safe landing safe doing it without gps and doing it even when things go wrong and I want to spend the last couple of minutes uh, of our conversation talking about flying from point A to B on Mars. You know, obviously the first part of the navigation issue is where is point A? How does Ingenuity establish and hold its takeoff position? How does it know where it is? Um, well, so the, the the takeoff point at Ingenuity, like you know, it's it, it, it's by definition zero zero zero. Like you know, so we we, we, okay. we made things very simple here. Um, like you no, know, but uh, like um, then we're like we are really using the, that combination of measurements coming from like you know the like the, the camera like you no know, that tells us like in which direction we're going like you no know, so fully at takeoff it should tell you okay you're you're going up here or like you're going in that direction then the inertial sensors like you know tell you okay well that's uh, like you no know, the the gravity is in that direction and op- hopefully like you no know, that's aligned with the the direction that the camera tells you because like you need you need to go up. And then the laser range finder, like you know, like make sure that you like you're you're containing uh, the the drift of this inertial estimate. I know that they work as like dead reckoning sensors, the this inertial sensor, like you know, so the the altimeter is here like to contain that. Now, actually, on on the very on the very first two seconds of takeoff, like you know, when we close to the ground, to to make sure like you know that we don't meet any uh, what we call the ground effects, like you know that maybe like you know any flow interaction with the ground. I know we're actually just trying to control the orientation of the helicopter, like, you know, make sure it says, like, you no know, level and just, like, push off the ground as fast, a boost off the ground as fast as we can. So for that very first two seconds, we are, we are just using the, uh, the inertial sensors to keep ourselves level. We're not even trying to use the camera and the, uh, and, 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 and the laser range finder. So if I understand you correctly, point A or the origin is zero, 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 but you want to go to a point B which, you know, in the case of the last flight was over 100 meters away. How do you establish point B and how do you say this is the um, geographic relationship between point A and point B and ingenuity head in this direction? So you are going in, in addition to point A being like zero, 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 you also have axis, like, you know, you're going to have X, Y, Z in like in three perpendicular direction. And before the flight, like, you know, one of the information we give ingenuity is that, okay, like point B is going to be say like 50 meters in X and, like an, and another 50 meters in Y at, at five meter elevation in Z. 
And you know, from that point on, like basically like Ingenuity is only trained like to find that, that point B destination in terms of the, the relative coordinates with respect to that to that first frame. That means that like at no point do we have like you know any absolute correction or position fix. Like you no know, we're like progressively accumulating like you no know, some errors, like like you know, as, like, you know, as each image measurement and some noise, each inertial and you no know, so we always have a little noise. So the challenge is to make sure that this noise, this noise level don't accumulate in a way that, that make us drift too much. But the, the performance of this flight is that on the um, on flight three, for instance, where we are like uh, 50 meters and back, like you know, so 100 meters total, the drift like from the uh, the, the target uh, objective was about like 36 centimeter. Like, you know, so that's about like you no know, 0.36 percent. Like you no, know, that that's almost as, as as good as it gets. Like you know, on the on 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 the research papers. Um, so like you know, th th that's the kind of of operation it it, it takes to uh, to get ingenuity there and back. Which makes me wonder though, Mars is a dynamic planet. Mars has winds, Mars has those dust devils we're talking about. As Ingenuity is flying between point A and point B, if it count, encounters something in the atmosphere that um, will alter its trajectory, is it able to account for that in real time or, or, or how is that accounted for? Yeah, it, it can. So like the, the control system basically is modeling for disturbances. So the main one that we're expecting are the wind and the gust that you can have in flight. Uh, when the control system was designed, like you know, we were able to use uh, prediction models, like you know, from wind experts uh, JPN and at NASA, like you know, where like on the on the given landings on the given J0 area, like you know, we knew that like if everything comes through, like we should have like not not more than nine meters per second, like you know, average wind during like on on a given day during a flight, and variations in flight of not more than like 3.5 meters per second. So like we were able like to tune our flight controllers to make sure that we are stable within this bounds. Now there is still some uncertainty, like you no, know, for instance, we have we have never flown or like you no know, been able to reproduce a dust table, for instance, in the vacuum chamber. So should one like you know come to meet your path like in flight, um, you know, that would be like a, a, a big surprise to us what 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 happens. But that's part of the things we we haven't like you no know, designed for. As you've reviewed the data of the last four flights, is there any insight into the amount of wind that ingenuity encountered? Uh, yeah, so I haven't like you know accessed the data from all flights on 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 my part. I'm not on, on the sure, operation right. team directly, but on the on the first flight, like you know, it seemed that we got like winds like you know up to like you know six eight meters per second, like you no. Know, so that that seems like you no know, so far within the bounds of uh, of these wind models that that we have. And um, you know, I I should add like you know that we also have like you no know, daily forecast from the rover like you know uh, weather station. It's a device called Mida. Like you no, know, we don't have a check like no right before the flight like you no, know, so that there's only like so much we can do, um, and there's also a lot of uncertainties like you no know, regarding the winds on Mars because okay, it's already out on Earth like you no, know, and we have weather stations all around the planet on Mars. You know, we only have data from like a, 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 the few past missions, uh, but so far like the the flight data seem in line with the the prediction we received. Well, we're gonna have to land the vehicle. So again, we're flying from point A to point B, and. How does the vehicle know it's found a safe place to land? I mean, there are things like incline in the terrain. There could be the difference between a pebble and a boulder. And certainly that terrain you're going to is going to be at a different altitude, or, you know, height above ground level than your point of origin. How does Ingenuity figure out, hey, this is the safe spot for me to land? So during the first four flights, Ingenuity was always coming back at the same spot, and that spot, like you no, know, which uh, ended up being called the Wright Brothers Airfield, it had been uh, reviewed and, and 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 analyzed by the rover instruments, like you no. Know, so we knew uh, what the three topography looked like on the terrain. We knew it was safe of hazard, and we knew that like the like it was overall flat, and that the slope was like you no know, level uh, like to with up to within a degree. So we knew that. On the um, during the fourth flight, we collected like you no know, images uh, in flight which have overlaps between them. These images like have like are in the process of being returned to Earth, and you no know, because they overlap, we're, we're going to be able like to reproduce like the benefits of having you no know, two cameras on the helicopter, but not because we actually have two cameras. Like you know, we're, we're going to use the same image, the same camera image at two different moments in time. And we we're, we're gonna like you know do a, a virtual triangulation if you want because like you know of you of using the same the, the same camera image at different time, and so that's gonna give us what we call digital elevation models of them like you no know, which which are which are gonna give us 
topography, a lack of the terrain along the flight. And if things look good, like we might try to land at a different spot, like you know, during the fifth flight, and, but that, that will be the first time uh, like, you know, this, this, this happens for ingenuity. One important thing to note is that uh, in the current, uh, like you know, in the current software that is on board, like you know, this there has to be a ground loop, like you know, to get this data, like you know, process it here on Earth. Uh, but future versions of the of the helicopter, like the sense helicopter I mentioned before, like will have like the the, the ability on board to like you know, detect the safe landing site and make and make the landing decision. It wasn't critical for Ingenuity because there were like so many more challenges to like you know, to pass through first, and and there still are. Um, but that, that's the directions we are taking for, for future helicopters. Just a, a couple last closing questions about this remarkable vehicle and, and um, called Ingenuity. One of the things I noticed is that when Ingenuity was lowered by Perseverance and Perseverance drove away, it looked like you already had a little bit of Martian dust on the solar panels. Uh, is that accurate, or am I just the untrained Martian observer? No, that's completely accurate. Uh, there were there were more dust than we than we anticipated. Uh, I think the current belief is that, like you know, during uh, the EDL, like you know, if you look at, at 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 the video of the rover being landed, the very last few seconds, like you know, you've got eight thrusters on the sky crane, like you know, just like blasting off like all the way, and and you have like recirculation of the dust, like right under the rover, and that's exactly where Ingenuity was, and like you know, you have some. Like even though there was a protection shell, like you, know, you have some cracks on top, like you know, and and we think that that's how the dust came in. And hopefully this isn't a crazy question, but you know, certainly as dust accumulates on those solar cells, are you able to say, well, we're just going to do a fast high speed flight here and get all that dust blown off, or is the atmosphere really not um, thick enough to think about using it for you know blowing the the solar uh, panels dry or clear on Ingenuity? So not a crazy question at all. Actually, that was a question like you know that the, the power uh, like you know and, and the, the power team had like you know right after the first flight, uh, like you know Teddy Zanetos, the deputy operation lead, uh, lead uh, Yako Karas uh, that work on the electrical system, actually like you know uh, showed in the data like you could actually even at uh, on, on the first flight like you could actually see chunks of sand actually flying off the solar panel because like you no know, you get the day like you no know, how much like you no know, current is like you no know, is, is coming in on the solar panels and you know, and you can see the like you no know, the, the power output just like you no know, rise during the flight and you know, the only explanation that you know, that makes sense was like you no know, well you get like you no know, some of these chunks of sand basically are just falling off and that was confirmed on you know, the the, the post flight pictures from the rover where you see that basically the solar panel like got a cleanup and that not only happened on flight one, like you no, know, like the, the the solar panel, like you no, know, got more and more efficient as the flight came in, and uh, so yeah, so there there seems to be an, a natural cleanup process that happens during flight, which is uh, very important for future design because, for instance, uh, the the previous generation rovers, uh, uh, like Spirit and, and Opportunity, the Mars exploration rovers, that you know that got their power input through solar panels, whereas current generation rovers are using RTGs, so radioisotopic thermal generators. Uh, but the previous generation, like they had, uh, they had to put themselves in, like you know, in, in specific all position to make sure that they that 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 their solar panels get cleaned, and that's something that we're going to be able to avoid with the helicopters because they have they have this natural ability to clean themselves in flight. Now I don't want you to spill any JPL secrets, but when we start looking at flight six and seven and that flight cadence, you know, of a flight every one to two weeks. Are there going to be some like incredibly awe-inspiring missions where you just let the helicopter go and you know report back when you land? <laughs> uh, you know, and you're gonna you're gonna cover more of Mars than any of the other rovers have. Uh, so we 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 might be able like you no know, to cover like more of Mars ground like you know in in one soul like you no know, that that maybe some of the rovers but like you no know, that big same the current the Perseverance rover can cover like you know up to 200 meters a day like you know so that that's a fairly long distance, uh, but yeah on on flight four we're able to cover 266 meter like you no know, so yeah so per day we will be able to to cover more that that being said like you know the rovers like you no know, like last a decade almost like you know, that's what we've seen like you no know, so overall like you know their, their flight distance is going to be longer um to answer your to, to the to your question specifically like you no know, we like when ingenuity flies like you no know, it, it it's always got these waypoints like you no know, which we set in the first place like you no know, so there is no never never going to be like you no know, free flight mode we say like okay just go on your own and see what happens like you know that most likely would not be good um, but but uh, yeah, I think you no, know, we are we're certainly pushing the limit. The limit now. I think now you know, we are we're trying to, like you know, 
more than just pushing the limit. I think the focus will try to you know to demonstrate okay what what data can we get like you know to inform the rover and like you know and even if the rover like you know is designed to like to operate on its own like you no know, it does not need ingenuity like if it gets success like you no know, useful data like you know can that help their operation and like you know and like make them like let them go through harder terrain or like maybe save time because now they might go they might go a path that would not have been deemed safe enough before out of just how much uncertainty there was on on what they could see from the ground can ingenuity speak to the um orbiters right now or does it need perseverance as a link it's it it relies on the on the perseverance to ingenuity link to talk to the orbiters uh, so it it's not in, ingenuity is not an independent spacecraft uh, an, an an independent aircraft Future missions, though, like, could have a direct-to-orbit uh, communication link, and not direct to Earth. That, that, that's just to have, but direct-to-orbit uh, is definitely on the table for future helicopters. It is an amazing vehicle that is a credit to everyone at JPL and NASA and Aero Environment and all the partners that were involved in building it. It's a huge credit to humanity. It's a huge credit to the engineering profession. And let me just end with one thing here, Jeff. When you look up at the sky again and you see the rest of the flight challenges in the solar system, what are other ones outside of Mars that capture your attention and say, hey, if only I could take an Ingenuity type vehicle here, we could do something incredibly exciting as well. Well, I think like no, the the next one has actually already been identified by NASA. Like no, and there's going to be the Dragonfly vehicle that will actually take off, uh, I think in 2027, uh, to go to Titan, which is like the the moon of Saturn. Uh, like no, it's going to be produced by uh, John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Like no, so that like no, very exciting. Like no, that there's already like the a second generation of rotorcraft. Like no, and going to different planets. That's going to happen. Like you no, know, now the like Titan is very different from Mars. Like you no, know, it's 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 almost like you no know, designed to fly. Like if you were like on Titan, like you know you could like you know, almost take off. Like you know if you had your own wings on the ground. Uh, but like you know the the distance like you know from Earth is also much larger. And it, like you no, know, it's it, it has its own set of challenges. Like you no, know, so Titan like you no know, is going to happen. Like you no, know, in the in I think around 2034. Uh, then I think the other destination for like aerial vehicles, like you know, and not only like drones or watercraft, is Venus. Like you know, there's a, there was a lot of interest, like you know, in the past few months because we think we may have found like you know some of the compounds necessary like for life in the Venus atmosphere. We know that the conditions about 40 kilometers above the ground are like you know of pressure and temperature, like you know, right around what what we would have on Earth. So like you know, we're talking about having balloons, airship, like you no know, maybe with like some probes like you no know, maybe maybe drone that could like you no know, drop to the ground and like you no know, and try to make some more local measurements um yeah so i think you no know, like titan venus like you no know, definitely like seemed like a bit like beyond mars to be the other worlds where like aerial vehicle exploration are like you no know, seem to be on the table jeff thank you so much for taking us to mars telling us how this incredible vehicle the team has put together operates and how it navigates love to have you back as more data is collected thank you so much for joining us Thank you so much for having me and thank you for your questions.